find out what's on TJC. Sign up for our weekly email newsletter at www.tjctv.com. Welcome to the Salon. On this episode, Fighting the Gender Pay Gap at Jewish Organizations, Natalie Portman's controversial new film, Jewish Women Go Into the Ring, and a new modesty handbook shows women what not to wear. It's coming up on the Salon. Hello, I'm Jane Eisner, editor of The Forward and Forward.com. And I'm Rachel Sklar, editor-at-large for Mediaite.com. Welcome to the Salon. So Rachel, you and I both have December birthdays, and I understand you did something pretty wonderful for your birthday. Well, I don't like to brag, but yes, I did. <laughs> um, I donated my birthday. I had a little birthday fundraiser for Donors Choose, and I organized a little party with a minimum $20 donation, and we raised almost $7,000. So it distracted me from turning a year older. That is so wonderful. Well, another distraction I hope that will help is that we have a wonderful lineup of guests. With us is Rachel Schuchert. She is the author most recently of Everything is Going to be Great, an underfunded and overexposed European Grand Tour. Next, we have Binny Klein, psychotherapist, radio host, and she's the author of Blows to the Head, How Boxing Changed My Mind. And finally, also with us is Shifra Bronznik. She is the founding president of a remarkable organization, Advancing Women Professionals and the Jewish Community. Welcome to you all. So um, recently, The Forward published its second annual survey of uh, the salaries of Jewish communal leaders. And uh, what we found was uh, interesting and frankly somewhat depressing. The number of women leading these organizations has actually decreased from year to year. Um, the pay gap, the m amount of money that the women earn versus men, went up a little bit. The gap itself closed a little bit, but still we found women are only earning 67 cents for every dollar that men 67? earn. 67? 67, yes. Wow. And uh, we also found that when it came to raises, a real lot of the men got raises, uh, even in these recessionary times, and not as many women did. Now, Shifra, I know this is an issue that you have been following for many, many years. Can you just explain why does this kind of gender and leadership gap persist in the Jewish world? Well, first of all, it persists in the general culture as well, although some argue that it's more egregious in the Jewish world. I think this, what's important to think about is if, in fact, there was this kind of pay gap and it was men who were being underpaid, we wouldn't be discussing why it's happening because it would have stopped happening already. Mm -hmm. And the fact is this is something that's gone on for decades and that we know about it. And I'm hoping that your study and the most recent study from the Jewish Communal Service Association is going to finally galvanize Jewish women and say, we don't really want to be unwilling million dollar donors to the Jewish community because that's what this pay gap ends up costing women over a lifetime. And I also hope that it'll mobilize the men who head these institutions to say, we don't want to underpay two thirds of our workforce because it's going to mean we lose talent and we lose equity. So we're also dealing with this situation where there are so few women leading these organizations. Our study found 12% and the communal s services study that you referenced also found 12%. So we know these numbers are pretty correct. I, you know, do younger women look at those kinds of odds and say, forget it, I'm going to just go work someplace else? I think young women, by the way, are starting their own organizations. And I think some of the people here are social <laughs> entrepreneurs of that sort <laughs> because they feel that many of the traditional organizations are actually in decline. And if they want to have robust leadership opportunities and have an impact in the world, maybe they should go out and start their own um, innovative operations. I do think that that's true, actually, as a younger woman, you know, sort of sometimes becoming involved with Jewish organizations, that there is a little bit of suspicion around you, you know, that you're not really that serious because you're young. This is just sort of a, you know, a hobby or it's something that you're doing, you know, to fill time. And it, it doesn't seem, I, 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 there's always sort of this issue as a younger woman of, of, of being seen as an equal of professional women who are older than you, just in a sort of serious mm -hmm. sense. I think that uh, for women there, there is an interesting sort of age issue more so than men where, you know, there's a sweet spot of being old enough to be taken seriously, but not too old to trigger a sort of ageism 
issue, which I'm in the media world, in politics, you definitely do see that there's a trigger. Yeah. For, you know, I mean, w one of the things I really noticed when Hillary Clinton was running for president was how the uh, the group of women, the Pumas, the sort of like older uh, older women voters and voting bloc was really marginalized and it was like a silent majority. Um, and that's just something that I've, I've definitely noticed. I don't know if that's something that you can speak to. Well, one of the things that we're seeing is that there's a new generation of young women coming into leadership and coming into their own, and they're actually not going to be as complacent about leaving things as they are. So I'm actually very excited by the possibilities for real change finally. In the Jewish community, we've really had this old boys network for such a long time, and I think it's one of the reasons we're in decline as we are. And these young women are not prepared to be taken out of the game because they want to have babies. That's why we're having our Better Work, Better Life campaign of having full parental leave and flexible work environments. And they're not willing to be paid less, and they're not willing to really donate a million dollars over the course of their lifetime to the Jewish community without any recognition for it. So they're going to get their pain. If they want to be philanthropists, they're going to do it on their own terms. Yeah, I don't think that this younger generation of women sort of subscribes to this Hadassah lady volunteer kind of mentality that this is sort of your duty and don't expect to be really appreciated or compensated for it. You know, if it's a career, then it's a career, and then it needs to be treated as such. It's not this sort of obligation that you have because that's what the ladies do. Well, it's wonderful to hear this. Yeah, Benny. Jen, do the results of the study mirror the larger gender gap in society? It's w the worse. I, I think it's fair to say that at least all the numbers that I've looked at, and Schiffer, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, we see, you know, yes, it is true that men dominate a nonprofit leadership, but by a much smaller amount. Um, in fact, one study I, I I recently saw showed that 47% of the charities in America are run by women. A lot of those are smaller charities, but even when you factor that out, at least a third of the, of the larger ones, ones with over a million dollars of a budget every year, are run by women. So we're really behind on this. We're very much behind, and it's even of the larger charities, 18% are run by women as compared to the numbers that you found in the Jewish community. And you know, part of it is, I think that uh, these Jewish organizations have two challenges. One is this family-like atmosphere that doesn't prize professionalism and excellence the way other kinds of communities do. And the other is this sort of dominance of the male rabbi narrative, which is again shifting with lots more women rabbis coming to the fore. But it's almost like God is a man, religious leaders are men. That male narrative voice that we've read for 3,000 years really creates a very flourishing environment for this kind of inequity to persist. But all it takes to change it is to change it. And I'm very much hoping that there's going to be a coalition of women and male allies who say, we want a robust community and we want people to be paid fairly in it. Right, of course. I mean, th this isn't just a, a woman's issue. And this is one of the things that I find frustrating about having these conversations is that they seem to take place only between women and saying, well, it's a problem. You know, and, and it's, yeah. it's not only a problem for us. Any time that talented people are inhibited from advancing as another group might, then we're not getting the best of the talent pool, exactly. and we're not getting the best of diversity, which means we're not getting the best of innovation and the best minds and the best results. So it it's yeah, it also discounts men who actually might want to prioritize their family, you know, who might want to sort of have their personal life actually exactly. be a personal life and not devote every waking second to their job. And by the way, why do we think our organizations are in decline if they're run by people who think you're supposed to work 24-7? How vital does that make them? And why should Jewish professionals be left out of family life, cultural life, spiritual life, innovative life, because they're supposed to be working all the time if they want to be in leadership? We need much more well-rounded leaders than that picture would suggest. Well, I thought we could uh, go from there to um, another very interesting topic, uh, Jews and sports. Not an oxymoron, necessarily. <laughs> um, Vinny, you have um, really gone through a very interesting journey in your life uh, from a psychotherapist who wasn't exactly always uh, super athletic to someone who found herself in the ring. Can you explain a little uh, bit about sure, this and, and sure. the kind of work you're doing? Yeah. 
Um, talk about a transformation. I think as a child, I barely broke a sweat. <laughs> you know, uh, growing up in the 50s in Newark, I played stickball and hit the penny and things like that. I think a lot of opportunities for women involving sports have grown tremendously over the years. I think a lot of it has to do with rural versus urban locations. Mm -hmm. If you're in the suburbs, you have access to more exercise and groups and things like that. Um, the history of boxing in this country became very fascinating to me. When I got involved with it, I wasn't sure why, but I found that between 1910 and 1940, there were about 27 to 29 Jewish champions. And that meant something to me. It moved me, and it got me interested in a sport I'd previously thought of as very violent and repulsive. So tell us about your own experiences, actually, boxing? Well, it started with breaking my ankle in my own backyard. Um, like I said, I was pretty sedentary. I'm a psychotherapist and a radio host, but not very athletic. And when I broke my leg, I went into rehab. And some boxing gloves in the gym called out to me, and I didn't know why. <laughs> and I didn't know whether there was some kind of suppressed rage or <laughs> identification with my father who had loved therapist. boxing. I'm sorry, I know. It yeah. just yeah, it runs no, through my, my bones. My but mother the, is also <laughs> <laughs> the minute that I put on the gloves, I felt a power surging through me. Wow, that is just wonderful. I mean, do anybody else anybody else here participate no, in sports? No, but now I'm going to. <laughs> no, but this is a good way to get them to change the pay gap. Well, <laughs> well you know, you're gap. not far just off. Take out the gloves. That's right. You're not far off because boxing, as it turns out, is a very mental sport. And what does it teach you? Like, what is the value of sports to kids, even though I didn't grow up with it? First of all, keep your composure at all times, okay, mm. which is good for business. It's good for all kinds of mm. endeavors. Um, protect yourself at all times, and just stay in the game. It teaches you focus, determination, and so forth. Yeah, I did a lot of ballet as a kid, which is sort of not a sport per se in the competitive sense, although it is a pretty competitive world. Um, but it kind of, it's that same kind of focus, like you get this sort of steely-eyed, like everything has to be an exact way, which is, uh, has some difficult prospects for your long-term mental health. But it's very good, I think, for a kid like I was, whose attention was sort of always all over the place. And it, it's almost meditative, yeah. Yeah. you know, in a very, but in a very like achievement-oriented kind of way. Also, what, what was meaningful to me, I hadn't been incredibly identified with Judaism growing up for a variety of reasons. But once I got interested in boxing, I realized that Jewish boxers had really changed the sport. They had brought a scientific element to it. A lot of them were what's called lightweights. So they focused mostly on defense mm -hmm. and were really <laughs> 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 Well, you know, sort of make do with what you have. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Not a large people. I, I mean, I, th I think of women in sports in a different context, which is, you know, the, what you're describing, boxing and ballet and, um, are, are individual um, connections there. But I s saw with my daughters growing up, uh, you know, they went to day school so they could be on any sports team they wanted because they weren't all that good. Um, yes. But they were very inclusive and it really worked to create this sort of sense of understanding what it was like to work on a team. Mm -hmm. And I think that women really were disadvantaged by that for so long because there was this sense, I mean, I'll never forget, you know, after these basketball games where no matter how competitive they were, the teams would line up and they'd like, you know, touch each other's hands. And that whole sort of sense of here's how we conduct ourselves both as a team and in a competitive environment, I was really happy to see them do that. Sports and that's been teach a big change. you to um, interact with other people in a very positive way, but they also give you a sense of confidence. And I think the Jewish boxers and the ballet and the stuff that kids today are doing really defy the stereotypes that still linger for Jews. Mm -hmm. We were the pale scholars, our mm -hmm. heads bent over books. Mm -hmm. We were being protected. The, the, the boys who became boxers, um, it was considered a shanda, a shame for them to go in the mm -hmm. ring. But when they went in the ring, and I'm talking about immigrant early in this century, um, they made more money than in the sweatshops. Mm -hmm. And so the parents began to be persuaded of that. Such nachas. <laughs> <laughs> my son the boxer. <laughs> exactly, my son the boxer. And for women, like on the cover of my book, we used a picture of either, it's either Bessie or Belle Gordon, we're not sure who. 1901 speed bag punching champion. We think one of these women was Jewish. Um, Jewish women immigrants um, were slow to it because there was even more concern about physical damage to women. Mm. 
I could see that. You know, that sure. you should, and, and you shouldn't be competitive, and you shouldn't be aggressive. Well, what is the risk of physical damage? I mean, that's where my head goes. I'm like, yeah, that sounds really fun. I would love to get in the ring and, you know, and do it up like Rocky, but like, what, what are the real risks? Well, your, your book is called blow, A Blow to the Head or Blows to the Head. It's so. Blows to the Head, A Boxing Changed My Mind. I get asked this question a lot, and it's a very important question. The range of differences in danger and risk between amateur and pro boxing are enormous. In pro boxing, which I'm certainly not going to do, I'm barely even an amateur. I'm an unlikely contender. I'm really a historian <laughs> at this point. Um, would be very small to you. Like you would wear headgear. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't even be sparring until your coach deemed you ready. Mm -hmm. And it really your mouth guard not. too. Mouth guard, okay. yes. Mouth guard definitely. And pretty shorts, shiny shorts, right? Shiny <laughs> shorts, yeah. yeah. Don't hit the face. Yeah, hit the face. <laughs> right. It's actually a much safer sport than one can think. Now, this is not to underplay what can happen in pro boxing, that there are tremendous risks. Boxing is a very complicated sport, and that's part of why it's drawn so many writers and filmmakers to it. But I never encourage anybody to take any risks. Well, and it does have kind of a sort of uh, a complication and like a sort of storied narrative to it in a way that other really dangerous sports don't. How do you don't. mean storied narrative? That's in the way that you can sort of, uh, there's a story in a boxing match. You know, you have this sort of antagonists and you can sort of ascribe things to them, motivations or why they're doing this that, you know, other mm -hmm. really dangerous sports like maybe like skiing or something don't quite have, right. you know, I mm -hmm. feel like you're just sort of, I like watch people go down the hill and I'm like, how are they not? Their mother must be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's with, exactly with right. It's a, it's a primal drama. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's a very primal drama. It's yeah. person to person and it's kind of a narcissist dream. You know, the other person is there and you just need to get yeah, through Yeah, and there's them. no real, like, questions of morality around it either, you know, like you're sort of wrestling with this demon and the other well, person take... isn't exactly, it's like Jacob and the angel, is that Oh, yeah, yeah. And take... Oh, bringing it back. Oh, well played. Yeah. Jewish day school! Oh. Okay, bring it back from the Bible now to modern day time. <laughs> Fantastic Orthodox Jewish boxer Dimitri Salida. Yeah. He practices, you know, Jewish rituals, doesn't fight on the Sabbath gentle spiritual guy but gets in the ring mm -hmm. and his job is to fight although there was we did a story um looking at the halachic the jewish law legal debate about whether you can really inflict harm on someone oh, and in what, that way what and and it? as you can imagine uh, there was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, well, if you're I mean, going to talk about inflicting harm there's i mean if you're going to be in business your job is is to you know, create value for your company, and you know that means if you're in competition with another company, then your value will, you know, maybe create harm that way. I mean, there's it could, but we, but, but physical harm, I think, but is Jay, something. Why different. don't we apply the financial harm? Why don't we apply it to financial <laughs> yes, harm? I mean, when true. I think about the topics that we're talking about, we're very complacent in our Jewish values-driven organization about letting women be underpaid or letting them not. Bringing ascend to leadership, yeah, and I think it's really important that we recognize that, and I think where it fits to me and where I'm sparked by this conversation about boxing is one of the things we've learned is there's actually a gender divide in negotiation, and women negotiate very well on behalf of others, uh, but when it comes to negotiating on behalf of themselves, they're often not as ready to negotiate and ask for what they need and deserve, and in fact, when they do, they're not responded to as well, and they have to negotiate differently and find a way to do it, not to say, this is what I want, this is what I deserve, but to say, it would really be good for the whole system and the whole organization if I'm paid yeah. fairly. Well, everyone but on both fronts, when everyone fronts is we're not equal. doing it. But on both yeah. fronts, we're not doing it. So we have to get your notion of first do no harm, like let the Jewish community not do any harm. Well, and I, but I think a lot of it is up issue. to us, too. I mean, those of us who are in leadership positions, I mean, I'll never forget the first time one of my younger staffers came in to ask for a raise which I couldn't actually give her at that moment, but I first said to her, I am so proud of you. I mean, I knew, I could tell she was shaking. She was like a little red on the cheeks and in, the, in her neck. And she, was, she obviously had screwed up so much courage to come and do this, and I thought it was great. And I think it's incumbent upon us to salute that. I mean, even if we might not be able to right, actually right. afford to give it, or, to, or find to some really way, to, way yeah. um, Well, to the thing do, is, yeah. if we're acculturated to defer and to be pleasant, right? 
and you know and not be pushy. Thank you. Yeah, we were just talking about this in the green room. That's right. We were talking right. about dealing with the publicist for the books, for our separate books, and yeah. how not I didn't have this experience with my first book, but ha publishing is such a. Uh, this is sort of off topic, but publishing is such a like female oriented. It's not off topic. Don't say that. Yeah. But you have to assert yourself <laughs> in this conversation. Yeah, on the top. And, and it's and it's very much like women doing this. When I was talking about this publicist on my first book, and we, I, I was sort of felt like you know there was sort of this uh, attitude that um, we're just supposed to be like sorority sisters, and every little thing she did, I was supposed to. Thank yeah. her Thanks like so over so the top much. and put like a million smiley faces and exclamation points <laughs> in my emails and things like that. And I sort of, which is not really my sort of standard right. operating procedure, right. but I did my best. You know, I was game. I was like, well, I'll sort of play the game. I'll be bubbly and fun. Um, not that I'm not bubbly and fun, but you know. And then once after she had like screwed something up for like the seventh time, I wrote her like a really direct, very like, you know, just no nonsense business like email that was like look this really is a problem this needs to be fixed uh, is there anything i can do to help but it wasn't you know and how was it received she never wrote me back <gasps> well you know what they teach wow. when they teach women in negotiation what they say and this is so painful to me but i tell it to women anyway yes you have to be tenacious yes you have to know your facts yes you have to be assertive yes you have to get in there and be willing to go on the line for it but you also have to be relentlessly pleasant yeah. which means when mm. people go like no i'm sorry i can't afford it you're like well, you know what? Let's talk and about really how you are going to afford it. <laughs> so that even if so you're really disturbing. angry, you have to be pleasant. That's so yeah. disturbing. Uh, isn't that disturbing? I feel like it's a symptom of the larger culture, oh, of yeah. the way people look on TV, the way people sound in sound bites, this kind of relentlessly pleasant kind of cooperative thing. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I, I wish we were relentlessly pleasant and cooperative. Have you looked at the Senate lately? Well, you have a good point there. No, that's true. That's true. That's true. It's but either there's sensationalist. Well, that's a good point. No, I try. <laughs> Not so no. watch Fox. I'd <laughs> like to sort of circle back to another thing that you uh, brought up, Rachel, uh, your experiences and in ballet and oh, learning ballet. Well, yeah. Because, mm. you know, we're now, um, there's lots of stories in the media about Black Swan, this new film that Natalie Portman is starring in, for which she had to lose 20 pounds. So she, yes, she was already a tiny person. Yeah. To, uh, you know, in that sort of, frankly, somewhat emaciated um, way mm. that. Uh, ballerinas present themselves. Yeah. I was just wondering what you think about that, especially as someone who has studied this art form. And as someone who had an eating disorder for my entire adolescence. Oh. Um, I think, mm. well, I think that it's very condescending, a lot of things that I've read suddenly intimating that Natalie Portman has developed an eating disorder right. because of this rigorous physical process she put her through herself through for this role. I mean, you see men have done that. Right. What about that Boxer Dale. movie yeah. with yeah. that Jack? Lamada or whatever. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Gained, Gained 20, 20 pounds. Yeah. pounds. Adrian Brody it's lost something game. like 75 yeah. pounds for The Pianist. And Christian Chris, Bale, Christian Bale yeah. starved himself to the skeleton for that film where he was the guy who Raging couldn't go to sleep. Right. I can't Raging remember Bull. the name. Thank you. So, I mean, I think that there's this sort of weird thing as with Natalie Portman. Oh, she's anorexic now. Like, well, she can't handle it. Women can't handle that. They get addicted to being thin and being admired for being thin. And it's not just a sort of dedication to her art right. and to this role. It's, right. it's it, right. you know, it's, it, it's not just her job and she won't get better. Um, but I do think that Jewish women are particularly prone to eating disorders. And I think that the reason why is that the culture constantly tells us that we're not attractive enough. You know, you see, especially There's a now, word for it, Zaftig. Yeah, Zaftig. And it's not even that I think Jewish women are any fatter, but but I feel that the culture right now, the way that, you know, you see, like, sort of the Judd Apatow movies where you have these, like, schlubby Jewish men who are mm. dating these, like, stick-like blonde shikses. Yet, there are all these really beautiful Jewish actresses who don't play Jewish roles. You know, there's Natalie Portman, there's Mila Kunis, who co-stars with her right. in The Black Swan. There's Scarlett Johansson, all of whom identify as Jewish, but never play Jewish characters because in Hollywood there is something unsexy about being openly Jewish as a woman. Hmm. As a man, it's somehow adorable, but Jewishness, your, your very trait, is somehow seen as unappealing. Well, what does Jewishness code as, in your opinion, in For Hollywood? these men, I think it codes as being, uh, you know, Mom. someone... Funny, Mom. neurotic, Get away from Mom. funny, neurotic, yeah. outspoken. And Somebody physically, what about the physical part, though? Because uh, that's what you were talking about. I don't know. Yeah, like physically, physically, it's like, oh, I think we're moving a little bit away from the yeah. Nebuchadnezzar classic you know, the classic uh, Woody Allen stereotype. Really? And What's the difference between Woody women, Allen and Judd Apatow women. and his guys? Um, well, I think pot. that... I they think, smoke a lot more pot. Yeah. <laughs> I think Judd Apatow is just is one. I remember, actually, the movie Keeping the Faith. Yes, I remember I really noticing that. that the Ben Stiller character was super hot, super fit. Yeah. You know, he was, like, super cool. He was great. And, and he got and the girls. Yeah, and there's a lot... He got the shiksa. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> was, but she um, converted. <laughs> uh, that's true. That's oh, true. good for her. <laughs> but the um, 
you know, there's, I do think there's, there, there's the Adam Sandler song with all the people who are Jewish. Like, there's just, there's, there's more diversity and it's, it's less of an issue. Uh, I think Judd Apatow did bring it back to the fore yeah. mm -hmm. a lot. And, and, and I think that we're still, and he's still working through mm -hmm. what, he's, what he's doing. Yeah, but I, this is what I want to see, is I want to see a female character in the movie who's just incidentally Jewish, who isn't like a Holocaust victim, or it isn't like part of the story, but she's just, you know, like the, the heroine of a romantic comedy who happens to be Jewish, the way that these men are sort of allowed to be, you know, where their Jewish is That's what I liked like about that actress, um, Deborah Winger. Yeah, who, yeah. Had, who had dropped out of sight for a while and recently yes. reemerged in that great series in Treatment. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, where, you know, she does look Jewish, but yeah, it's not a Jewish. huge... Right. It's not you who Mrs. Goldberg. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's different than that. Well, well, I feel like Natalie Portman say about, about Black that, Swan. A little bit, yeah. Is that Darren Aronofsky, the, the director, um, has a very, uh, what were we saying, kind of like a possibly sadistic, voyeuristic <laughs> right. approach. This is my problem. Yeah. I haven't seen the movie yet, but that in the film, whether or not Natalie Portman herself has gone too far. Yeah. She's self-mutilating. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of disordered eating in it. And he's just fascinated by it in a way that I yeah. find difficult mm -hmm. to watch. But lots like, of I movies found difficult are like to that. Watch with men for also. A dream. I mean, with men also. Did you see Leaving Las Vegas with Nicolas oh, yeah, Cage? Yeah. Sort of like. There is a romance about I mean, people who are artists films. feel that self destructive this is a quality that's very attractive I feel in a like there's way. something different about showing male dissipation mm -hmm. through like drunkenness and so forth and this thing that we're talking yes, about with women. Yes, but I actually sort of think that it's important to show women being able to be dissipated with the same kind of freedom as men and that women need to be permitted to be allowed to be make mistakes and to not be like these perfect good daughters all the time. You know, I think it really bothers me when you see these sort of films and the women are always the really uptight perfect ones who make everything run and they're never allowed to get drunk and they're never allowed to have fun and well, they're never allowed to Or it's only sort of when they get drunk and have fun that they become attractive to right, the Right, exactly. Hero. It's like now that you've debased right. yourself in front of me, I'm no longer threatened by you and right. want to have sex with you okay, I that get I've that. Your hair back while you puke. Right, I get <laughs> right. exactly. Here, I mean, okay, okay, I get Hollywood's that. Hollywood's dealing with like they have to keep it simple, right? They're dealing like Hollywood yeah. is behind, you know. I mean, like or your indie film, you know, comes to the fore with with pushing new themes. Hollywood, you're still, you know, the, the traditional rom coms are still, you know, still mired in these traditional roles. It's slowly expanding. And but you know what the problem is? They're heavily sexualized. Uh -huh. These portraits of women. This is my beef with it that makes them somewhat different yeah. than the male. That's so, uh, so there's now, a prurient and voyeuristic quality but then to can, watching them. Yes, it would be interesting to see some movie of a guy falling apart who immediately decides to explore his homosexual impulses. <laughs> OK, there we, we go. We did see yeah. that I movie. Like we probably that. broke back mountain. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's true. That's a great movie. And, OK, but you can certainly imagine that there would be a retort to all this if women in these movies are, and in, in public culture, are too highly sexualized, then maybe they should go in the reverse and uh, practice sneeze, practice modesty. Ah, <laughs> and, I get the segue she's got. Uh, very, well, very well, well, I mean, played. there's this a new handbook, that's news handbook, that has come out, uh, written by a man, uh, but oh, that wonderful. details in, <laughs> with lots of um, drawings that are very clear what is kosher and what is not kosher. So there are rules about where the neckline has to go, very high. Um, clothes have to be uh, loose and not tight fitting. Of course, knees shouldn't be shown. Cover your uh, knees! Uh, never mind those of you who are wearing slacks and pants. I'm afraid that that would not We're be kosher as well. I am um, so glad this rabbi yeah, took so much time bending. to really focus on this important <laughs> issue. Because there's nothing else that would have warranted such attention. Yeah, like in the, the pay gap. <laughs> community. But, but, but truly, I mean, is there something here? Is there something that's sort of trying to tell us that maybe we've swung too far in an opposite direction? That there needs to be some standards of modesty? No. The, the, this is um, someone trying to impose control over, over freedom. So where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. Where is this passionate desire to control who women are? What's, what's causing it to emerge? I think it's because there are orthodox women in leadership who are rising up. We have the rabbah. We have who you know may become the first orthodox woman rabbi. We have women with different roles. Some are called postcoat, which means that the person who makes judgments, the person who answers questions. And I think that is really inflaming 
the desire of certain Orthodox male rabbis to control women even more so. And I think in that so. case, it's actually kind of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hopeful sign that people are getting so crazy and nitpicky about whether or not your necklace touches your skin because you can't really turn back progress once it starts. You can That's only it. try to, like, stick your finger in the dam, but it's all going to come through. And I always sort of feel that, like, you know, before there's, there's always this, like, reactionary flair before there's, like, a great time of change. The progress to human rights is inexorable. The only question is the time. And I think that what we're talking about today is all about how to accelerate right. that mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. period. That it's going to happen is inevitable. It just has to happen faster so that the women who are around right now could benefit from it. Yeah. But, but meantime, though, there are the people who are caught in this, who are being told that um, even if their skirt goes to their calf, it's still <laughs> too high. Or even if their blouse is long-sleeved, it's still too tight. And, you know, do we have a responsibility to try to reach out or in some way not just sort of be haughty about, oh, those poor imprisoned women, but really try to sort of do what we can to, um, yeah, promote a certain sort of respect and modesty for the human body, but still say that it should be up to us to decide these things, not Is there else. a radical wing of the Orthodox female community? I think there's a progressive, there's a wing, the women that I'm talking about. I mean, I think the best thing we could do to help is to support the Orthodox women who are trying to take on leadership, mm -hmm. take on scholarship. Um, they started, uh, the first thing Sarah Horowitz did when she right. was named Rabbah was to start her own yeshiva called Yeshivat Maharat right. with five students so that right away she was determined to pass it on. So we could support those women because they're the ones who are going to have the most influence on their community. So we need to support the change agents within the Orthodox world. It is kind of funny though, <laughs> looking at that book, I was looking through and it's, it's like the opposite of like the what not to wear book. It's like which skirt length to choose to make sure that your calves look as fat and unattractive as possible. What to wear so you could never right. be so expected. You could, you could, <laughs> this is all about not tempting men, right? How to make your body look, that's what doesn't work thing. for your body? Right? It's this entire as thing, as possible. all of these rules about what women should do and what they can and can't wear and you know how much they should think about it, all in the service of not distracting men. Like, I, I'd like to give men a little bit more credit. Mm. I really would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this incredible detail to minutia that if you can keep people focused enough, and I, I sometimes feel this way, and I know people disagree with me, I sometimes have felt this way about the laws of kashrut, that it was a way to keep women really preoccupied in the kitchen with all mm. these like incredibly detailed, niggling rules, mm -hmm. and, and unable, therefore, to really focus on anything uh, in the broader world. You know, the more that you can get just infinitesimal, like, inside the home, and say that it's what God wants, you know, like how are you going to argue with that? It's very, it's But you know what the great thing is? They concentrated on other things anyway. <laughs> exactly. I mean, look at the history of immigrant women who came to this country. They were the ones out there. Yeah. Right. Um, they were unafraid and they were confident. Right. And I think also, sadly enough, we see examples of this in other fundamentalist communities, um, certainly in places in the Muslim world where women can't even show any part of their body mm -hmm. outside the home. And are um, punished, you know, very harshly. Very Partially. And, you know, maybe that will also serve as a warning to where we don't want to go. Yeah. Well, we have once again had a wonderful discussion here at the Salon. I'm very grateful to all of you, to my co-host, Rachel Sklar, to Rachel Schuchert and Benny Klein and Schiffer Bronsnick. Please uh, join us again for the Salon. You can continue this conversation on our Women's Issues blog on forward.com called The Sisterhood. This has been fun, hasn't it, Rachel? It's been a knockout. <laughs> <laughs>